Good morning. Um, I was chatting to a few people this um, week about how um, to get the most um, out of these um, online meetings together and, and how to guard ourselves really about against cultivating unhealthy habits or um, practices. And for me, it could all be summarized, I think, the good way uh, in one word, participate, to make sure that we are um, participating together, not to fall into a trap of thinking that this is just another event, another program to view on a screen like an online class or a, a Zoom meeting um, at work, or even just another program, although it would be more beneficial um, to us. But we're to think and remember that we're setting aside this time as God's people, as part of Christ Church um, Network, with one heart and one mind to sing God's praises, to come before him in prayer, and to hear from his words so that we can be built up and, and strengthened. This is no ordinary time. It's a time for our hearts to be filled with joy, our faith strengthened, our minds renewed, and our characters transformed uh, as we gather um, together, even though it be um, online. So here we are to worship our God.
Lord God. It may be that we are scattered throughout the city, but we recognize that we are united in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, united through his blood shed upon the cross. We praise and worship you for such a great salvation. Amen. Well, we look to the cross where Christ paid and the penalty for our sins and purchased our um, forgiveness. And so with confidence, we're going to pray together the words of the confession. God, our Father, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, you will keep your promise and do what is just. You will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Father, have mercy on us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We praise and thank you for the cross, that place where our forgiveness was purchased, our salvation made, the place where we were redeemed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I said about participating, one thing to do is to still physically do the things that we did when we were together. So why not stand up even though you're in your own home as Liam brings our reading from Acts. Well, please do turn uh, with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to be reading from verse 32. That's Acts chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 32. As Peter travelled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralysed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became ill and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood round him, crying and show him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we're going to spend some time digging further into this passage in our church family slot. Hello. We're going to play a short game to begin. We're going to show you a, a series of pictures and what I want you to do is to spot which one is the fake and which one is the genuine article. It's clear, isn't it? 
in most of these cases, which one is the genuine, the authentic article, the real thing? If we want to spot a fake, we need to ask ourselves, is this different from the real thing? Or does it have the real trademark? This is one of the questions God's people had in the book of Acts. The Apostle Peter was close friends with Jesus when he was on earth and heard his teaching. But what about now? Can we trust Peter? Is his ministry the same as Jesus' ministry? Is his teaching Jesus' teaching? Is Peter the genuine, authentic article? Well, the passage that we've just heard gives us the answer. Yes, Peter has the Jesus trademark. Let's look to see what Peter does. Do you recognise the miracles that Peter did? He healed a paralysed man, telling him to get up and roll up his mat, just like Jesus did. He brought a lady back from the dead, just like Jesus did. His actions are the same as Jesus's. So that's Peter's miracles. But what about Peter's message? Well, it's all about Jesus. He heals people not in his power, but in the name of Jesus. And people trust, not in Peter, but in Jesus after these miracles. So the miracles, the message, and the response of the people are all unmistakably pointing to Jesus. They have the Jesus trademark. Peter is the genuine, authentic article. Which means that we can trust Peter's message ourselves. His miracles are Jesus' miracles. His teaching is Jesus' teaching. And what Peter and the other apostles wrote, we can find in this book. So, as we read this, as we hear it taught, and teach it ourselves, we can trust it as the genuine, authentic article. Together, we're going to declare the Apostles' Creed. And in so doing, we recognize that uh, across this city, uh, we're doing this. Um, throughout the country, people will be doing it. And actually, of um, the various continents uh, of the world, these truths will be declared uh, by Christians. So let's stand uh, and declare together uh, what it is we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, please do be seated. Um, this um, week we um, suffered uh, a sad um, loss with the death of our um, dear sister, Mary Stockdale. Um, Mary was such a kind-hearted um, lady, always had a warm smile and an encouraging um, word um, for you. Um, she uh, and in um, great examples of persevering faith and a, uh, a joyful endurance. Uh, and she's now entered into glory freed from her um, suffering, um, now enjoying unhindered fellowship um, with the Lord. Um, but we want to be praying, um, especially for uh, Ian uh, and his uh, family, but for all of us as we uh, mourn. Uh, we're confident uh, that the Lord will uphold uh, Ian by um, his grace. 
um, but we also want to continue to um, be means of that grace in supporting um, him. And we're going to begin that spot now uh, by praying for him as Heather leads us in a time of intercession. We begin our prayers by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you that you are our almighty and powerful, loving God. In the Psalms, David wrote, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. We call on you to hear our cries for mercy and help as we are so weak and feel very helpless in the face of this pandemic. So many people are struggling and finding life difficult, whether through trying to homeschool children and work from home at the same time, through unemployment, through stressful work where too many demands are being made, through illness and loss, through loneliness and not being able to meet friends. We can so easily get focused in on our many problems, but please give us the faith to lift our eyes to you and focus on Jesus. You are our rock, unmoving and unchanging. Help us to fix our eyes, our thoughts on Jesus's compassion and care his love for others, the way he reached out to the poor and needy. Help us to remember what it took for us to become your children, his death in our place. Help us to remember the wonderful Easter Sunday good news. Jesus is alive. He's reigning as king and has promised to be with us always. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Like Dorcas in the Bible passage today, Help us to look out to see the needs of others and do what we can to help them. Help us to spur one another on, to keep running the race as your followers. Help us to keep holding out the good news so more people might hear of your love and mercy and be saved. To that end, we pray for the work that Martin Reynolds is involved with at Mission Assist. Thank you for all the easy English materials that are now available on the internet. People can access so many scriptures in simple English, and we praise you that over half a million people are using them across the world. Thank you for the recent Bible devotions that have caused some people to become Jesus' followers for the first time. That's so encouraging to hear and must spur the workers on to keep going with this work. But even when we don't hear about the fruit, we know your word is timeless and powerful and will be having an impact as the spirit works in the hearts of those reading or listening to it. Help Martin to be strengthened for his tasks, leading the team that types scriptures onto the internet in many different languages. Thank you for the extra work that has been done during lockdown. Please help Martin assess new materials and keep ahead of the team so they have projects available to work on. Thank you for Martin's diligence and perseverance and desire to share your word with others. May he also rest well and be refreshed for his work. We also pray for our Rooted in Christ group for young adults. Thank you for the new members who joined last term and the way they've settled into the group. Thank you for Jess and Sam and their team, leading the book groups, Bible studies, and Sunday night meetings. Thank you that they've been able to adapt to changing circumstances and worked hard to support the members. We pray for the members of Rooted in Christ 
to live a life worthy of the Lord, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith and overflowing with thankfulness. Help them to have a gospel-motivated holiness, putting to death what is not fitting and clothing themselves with what is in keeping with Christ. Please grow godly friendships in which they build one another up and pray together. And please help them to reach out with the gospel in your strength and power, with clarity of thought and speech, and a deepening conviction that you save people as your word is held out. Thank you for our elders and our faithful Bible teachers here in Christchurch Newland. Thank you that they care so much for all of us. As we're restricted in what we would like to be able to do in person, please give all of us thoughtfulness about how we can support the whole of our church family. Help us to keep encouraging each other with truths. As David also says in Psalm 28, the Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. We lift Ian to you and ask that he will know your peace and comfort as he grieves the loss of Mary. We thank you for Mary, for her faith and her gentle, wise ways. May Ian know you as the shepherd who is carrying him through this valley. We pray for our children and young people whose lives have been so disrupted. <clears throat> we ask that, knowing you are good and trustworthy and in control, will help them to feel sec secure and safe at this time. Please supply their parents with all the grace, energy, patience and wisdom they need as they teach them at home. And help us all to learn the lessons you are teaching us through this difficult season. Looking further afield, we pray for our country's leaders to have wisdom in the decisions they make. We pray for the situation in America to not escalate further and that the new president will rule wisely and justly over that country, recognizing that he does so under you. And we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters who are being unfairly treated and suffering for being your followers. Please may they know you are their shield, strength, and good shepherd as they experience your provision for them. We ask all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Heather. The Lord created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. All creation holds together and by the power of his voice. Nothing is outside of his control, nothing beyond his power. Even the power of death has been defeated by him. Let's sing together.
as we look to uh, dig deeper into the scriptures now, uh, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we see in this passage here uh, such amazing power wielded, um, such an amazing impact made on the people who witness these things. Lord, we pray that by that same power, you might be working um, that same powerful work in us. Change us uh, through your word. We ask this for your name's sake. Amen. Now, I want to begin by showing you some uh, pictures here. Uh, if we bring up on the screen my first one, you'll see what I mean. It's a doppelganger. Now, who is that a doppelganger of? It's Shakira, obviously. Looks so alike. Now, let me bring another one. Who does that remind you of? Can you tell? Well, I think this is, has an uncanny resemblance to Barack Obama, so close. But you might not realize that we have doppelgangers all around us. Now, who does this remind you of that we know at the moment? That's right, it's Scott. An uncanny resemblance to the mayor of uh, Manchester. Or how about this one? Who do you know who reminds you of the Milky Bar Kid? Uncanny. Now, I did try and find a picture of me and Joe Wicks. That was who uh, had the pain, uh, was convinced that I looked alike. I'm sure Joe's really um, glad about that uh, comparison. But I couldn't find a picture that looked similar to us because, uh, well, it doesn't exist. Now, a good doppelganger has an uncanny resemblance to another person, better than the examples I've provided. So why do I bring up doppelgangers now? Well, it seems we have one in our passage, a looky-loo, which is undoubtedly the most poignant thing that we notice about this pa passage. Now, there are many things we're going to look into and delve into into this passage, but what is unmistakably clear is that Peter's ministry looks like an almost identical replica of Jesus's, with a few key differences, of course. Now, let me make the case for you really quickly, um, because if you're not currently on board with me, I think you soon will be. Did you read this passage and get a sense of deja vu? A sense like we've been here before. Now, you might skim through Acts. No, it's not there. And then hold on. Yes, this is remarkably similar to what we've seen in Jesus's ministry. So in Luke 5, Jesus heals a paralyzed man, uh, one that is lowered to him through the roof of a house. And as a sign to show he has authority, even to forgive sins, he says to him, take up your mat and go home. Here, in our passage today, Peter finds this man who for eight years had been bedridden. He says, Christ heals you, get up and roll up your mat. Incredibly similar dialogue, isn't it? And more importantly, it's the same results. A paralytic walks again. Then we look at this woman called Tabitha or Dorcas, and she died, and Peter is sought after by some disciples that knew her, and they're about 10 miles away. Now, he sent them all out the room. He prays, and then he says, Tabitha, get up. And just like that, she gets up from death to life. And in Luke 8, we see a remarkably similar account with Jesus raising Jairus' daughter. Uh, he says to her, my child, get up, and she gets up, raised from the dead. The Aramaic phrase is revealed in Mark 5 as Talitha Kum. One letter difference from what Peter says, Tabitha Kum. Now, is that coincidental? No. This is clearly Luke showing his authorial intent as inspired by the Spirit to help us see the connection and realize this. Peter's ministry is authentically unmistakably, truly Christ-like. He's like a Jesus doppelganger. And although we might not put it like that, that's what we want to be like as Christians. 
to be recognised as being like Christ. And we want to do things for Christ that really make a difference. We want to have a character that reminds people of Jesus. We want to have our lives totally aligned with his. And so what I want to do today is focus our attention on aspects of the authentic Christ-like ministry that we can see here so that we can be Jesus' doppelgangers too. Now, the first aspect I want to draw your attention to is the personal aspect. Now, I think a lot of us recognise the importance of knowing people's presence. It's something we really notice the lack of at this moment in time. When we're in a bind, we say things like, we just wish someone would be there for us. Presence is precious. And so we see that displayed here, that present aspect of Peter's ministry. In Acts, we've seen a lot of time, um, we've spent a lot of time seeing the public ministry of the apostles. But here we see Peter traveling around to visit the Lord's people to strengthen and encourage them. Now we must remind ourselves of the purpose of this passage here. It took us no time to see the similarities between Christ's miraculous work during his own ministry and that of Peter's now. But these finer details are not any different. Luke wants us to connect all these aspects to show this is an authentically Christ-like ministry and no less in the personal aspect of it. As Christ was always on the move, not simply sticking with his first crowd, so Peter visits the disciples in surrounding areas. You see, this time of peace enjoyed by the church, which we learnt about in verse 31, didn't cause Peter to rest and stay in the comfort of Jerusalem. No, he saw this as a season of opportunity to do the rounds, to encourage the disciples that were further afield and scattered. And even the events are um, opportunistic in and of themselves. He's not on his way to find Aeneas. He encounters him um, on his travels. Now, from how he's described compared to Tabitha, we presume he's not a disciple, uh, but he just encounters him. But then he finds out his story. The desperate and dire situation of his, paral uh, his paralysis has put him in. He recognises that he's had eight years of this. He's probably past the point of despairing, accepting that that is his lot in life. But Peter took notice of him. He cared. And he was there for him in a way no one else ever could be before. Now, Peter wasn't en route to meet Tabitha either. It wasn't his intention to see her. When she died, the disciples who knew her heard Peter was nearby and sent for him to come immediately. And just like that, Peter drops everything and goes straight there. Now, I don't know if Peter had an idea of what was going to happen, but he knew that being there for these grieving brothers and sisters in Christ, that was important. Peter, like Jesus, had a personal ministry and therefore he was available and he was ready. He didn't hold on to the things of this world too tightly. His plans weren't too precious that he couldn't drop them when there was an opportunity to bless the body of believers. He was there for them when they needed. Now, if we want to be Jesus doppelgangers, if we want to have an authentically Christ-like ministry, we also need to be available to be present in people's lives. Now, at this time, you may be thinking, wow, you really picked a good time to pick, uh, bring this up, didn't you? Well, we've just started a national lockdown and we're thinking, well, how are we going to be there for each other? Well, actually, in fact, the importance of this is more apparent than ever because we're surrounded by so many needs, so many concerns. And I realise we can't physically be present except in a few cases. But the advantage that we have over Peter is that we have so many more ways that we can connect and be there for one another. So think, how can you be available for one another in this pandemic? How ready are you to pick up the phone to someone in need? 
Are you someone who people would turn to and call? How ready are you to meet someone for the daily walk we're allowed? How much time have you made available to check in on others or meet with them online? How often do you drop someone a message to build up and encourage them? Do you know people's prayer requests? Are you bringing them before the Lord? You see, we can be there for one another at this time, truly. And an authentically Christ-like ministry commits to being there for his people, just as Christ himself is ever present among us. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where someone is always there at the right or wrong moment. Now, there was a bit of banter in the staff team back when we were meeting here in the NCC uh, because Scott always seemed to be there at the moment when you didn't want him to be. <laughs> now, I'll give you some examples of how this worked out. Uh, if you said something stupid, guaranteed Scott would walk in at that moment. Maybe you did something funny, like you fell off your chair. Scott would see through the window. And as for me, I had this experience. Every time I made a cup of tea, <laughs> Scott would poke his head round the corner in the kitchenette and say, why aren't you doing any work, Liam? And the frustrating thing was I would have been hard at work, but just at that moment when I went down to make a cup of tea, you could guarantee that was when Scott would walk out of his uh, room, that he would walk up the stairs, and he'd poke in and catch me there. Uh, he started calling me the kitchen kid from then on, but it's not just about me. If you ask any member of the staff team, they will confirm this phenomenon. You can't see him right now, but there's all nodding heads in here. Now, some people you feel like are always there. Well, if we want to analyze our Christian ministry to one another, could it be said of us that we are always there? Now, I don't mean to catch people out, but in the sense that you are just so present in people's lives, so part of the furniture, so available to people, that they think of you as if you're always there. Now, you can't be that for all people at all times, can you? Only God can do that. But we believe that our God is sovereign. So are you available to those God has brought near to you and that you have been placed near? You see, the amazing thing is that God moves us around, he draws us together to show people his presence as we incarnate the love of Christ in and through us. That was what Peter was saying uh, when he uh, healed Aeneas. Jesus Christ heals you. Make yourself available so that God can use you to minister his presence to his people. And that's why it's so important that we don't fall into the temptation to regress to a private faith during this period. One that relegates Christianity to sermon consumption through our screens without being committed to the family. Yet it's not enough to be just present without being truly personal. Christ had a personal concern for people and compassion for where they were at. It didn't just arrive and coldly move people like chess pieces into the right place. He had a real compassion and concern for people. And that was continued to be expressed in Peter's ministry. Peter clearly cares for people indiscriminately. They might not be the most important people. One was an unbeliever, bedridden and ignorant to God's ways. Yet Peter cares. He notices him. He heard his story. He hears he's paralyzed for eight long painful years and yet it was God's will to burst into this man's life and bring healing. Peter cared because his master who directed him there cared. Similarly, Tabitha wasn't a mover and shaker in the early Christian church, but someone who was busy with their hands, doing good and making garments for the poor. When she died, the poor who benefited from her service lost someone who cared for them. And so Peter went to be with them. He cared because God cared about them. And by God's power, this woman was raised. 
not for her own benefit, but undoubtedly to the benefit of the poor who grieved her. That's why personal ministry isn't an optional extra for the converted people person. No, it's part and parcel of how God imparts his own concern for his people. Now, if you're struggling in this season, and I know many of us are, God has made his people present to incarnate the love of Christ through his people. That's why as a church family, we must continue to be there, to be present for one another so that we can display God's love. Now, the second aspect of this authentic Christ-like ministry is its power. Peter was more than just there for his fellow believers. He was the instrument of Christ to display amazing, life-changing power among them. You see, Peter's ministry really made a difference. It looked like it had the same power that Jesus' did. Now, there's a very good reason why Peter's ministry looked like Christ. Peter leaves us in no doubt that it was Christ's power at work in these instances. He doesn't want any glory for himself. Instead, he actively wants to make it known that Christ is at work. Now, wouldn't it be great if our ministry had this kind of power behind it? Wouldn't it be amazing to see the same impact made as uh, Peter's ministry saw? But why would, should we expect anything different today? Why shouldn't we expect a Christ-like ministry to display a Christ-like power today? Now, I think we recognize that the miraculous nature of Peter's ministry uh, that's shown here, it isn't the norm for how God works today. In fact, it wasn't normal for Peter's time. These were extraordinary outworkings of God's power. Yet we shouldn't conclude that God's power has waned over time. After all, if we think about Peter's ministry, what did he have? What did Peter have that God used? Did he have a special technique, uh, something which conjured Christ's power? Was he confident in helping these people because he had a unique therapy? No. What he had was a firm trust in Jesus and a theology which he lived out. He reckoned on the power of Christ because he knew that Jesus was the only hope for these people. When you're being there for people, are you ever tempted to offer therapy instead of living out your theology? Now, let me explain what I mean. We offer, we offer therapy when we have a known treatment to a known ailment. When people meet together and someone has a problem, I find that some people think it's best to... Um, to do in those situations is to offer a solution. Now, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's irrelevant because there is no solution for the problem. There isn't a treatment for the ailment. Theology, however, is what we know about God. And when our theology is right and we live that out, we will see the one who will make the difference in their lives. Now, lived out theology doesn't offer a solution as such, but a perspective which brings God into view and also has him in his right place. Peter didn't have an effective therapy, but what he did have was a right theology and he lived that out. Now, from his time spent with Jesus, he knew that Christ had authority to restore the brokenness of this world. He'd seen that firsthand. He knew that in Jesus, death was conquered and subject to his authority. Simply put, Jesus, uh, Peter knew that Jesus was Lord of all. So whilst the miracles displayed here are incredible, they're also in nature typical of what we know God can do by his power. In the case of Aeneas, we see restoration in a broken world. In the case of Tabitha, we see how Jesus continues to bring life. And in both cases, they serve to draw people into God's kingdom as they recognize the king of kings at work in their world. 
So how is Peter's theology lived out in this passage? Well, simply, it got him there and it got him on his knees in prayer. And God did the rest. You see, friends, if we have the same theology as Peter, if we know God uh, the same as Peter knows his God, then we should live that out. We should live in a way that makes clear our confidence that Jesus has power to restore brokenness in this world. That in him there is hope even in death. And as people see this uh, theology lived out by how we act, by what we say, then we can be confident that Jesus will draw people to himself for salvation. Be there. Be prayerful and God will do the rest. You see, there's no telling what God will do with even the smallest of events lived in faith. Peter thought he was going to be visiting some scattered disciples in Lydda. Yet God had in mind to bring everyone living there and in Sharon to faith. Then Peter thought he was being called out to comfort some poor grieving widows. But God had in mind to bring many people in Joppa to faith. Now, isn't that just as life-changing, maybe even more miraculous than the miracles themselves? And isn't God still changing lives today by bringing them to salvation? Well, of course he is. And he does so through Jesus' doppelgangers being there and being in prayer for those around them. Now, let me close by telling you a story I heard uh, Pete Burney from Riverside tell almost every St. Patrick's Day uh, when I was a student. In 18th century Ireland, there was a phenomenon known as the gin craze. Uh, back then, the water wasn't safe to drink. Um, it was contaminated by sewage being dumped in the water supply. Well, the people hadn't made the connection. And so people feared drinking the water and drank liquor instead. After par uh, Parliament banned the importation of liquor, people began brewing their own gin, and this led to what was known as the gin craze. Ireland, at this time, was not a safe or healthy place to live, and it was uh, plagued with rampant alcoholism. Now, at this time, a man named Arthur Guinness took notice of what was going on in society. He was a very wealthy entrepreneur. He had his own brewing company, and he also happened to be a Christian. He saw how people were choosing between dying of illness or alcohol, and he decided to uh, brew something better for people to drink. Now, what he developed was a dark stout that people would gladly drink, but had a much lower alcohol content than the alternatives. It still killed off germs, and it also contained a lot of iron, so it made you feel full, so you didn't have to keep drinking the stuff. And I suppose some people think it actually tastes nice. But what's more important is that this all came about from a con Christian conviction to use all he had been given by God to bless those around him. He lived out his theology. And so he didn't just make Guinness, he used his wealth to found the first Sunday schools in Ireland. He was one of a number of men who founded and ran a hospital for the poor. He donated vast sums of money to charity. He spoke out against the materialism of the upper classes. His employees, they were well paid. They were housed. They had medical care. The gospel had changed every aspect of his life and therefore, it informed how he should use his money, his business, his efforts, his platform. But you see, God didn't just work through his life, but through the lives of his descendants. Now, one of them alive today is Os Guinness, who's a popular Christian apologist and author. And he tells the story of an Irish widow who had fled to Scotland with her own two children. Now, her intention was actually uh, to commit suicide. Uh, but in Scotland, she heard the gospel, and amazingly, she was saved. She returned to Ireland, where she met one of the Arthur Guinness boys, and they married. 
Now, each day she prayed for their children, but not just for her children, but for the next 12 generations of Guinness children. As an answer to her prayers, that line of the family has kept the faith of their forefather, Arthur. And after so many generations later, her family are still believers in Christ and reaching out to countless others with the gospel. One little event, one little brewer, and yet God did mighty, amazing things. Now that is an incredible legacy that God brought about through one man. Is God still working powerfully today? Of course he is. Let's endeavor to be Jesus doppelgangers as we are there for people and reckon on his power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you work powerfully even today. And so we ask that you continue to work powerfully in our lives so that we can live out our theology. We pray that we would look like your son, Christ, that our ministry would be authentically Christ-like and that we would reckon on your power throughout so that you might minister your presence, your grace, your truth to all the people we know around us. We ask this for your name's sake. Amen. Christ's um, life-changing ministry continued through the apostles by the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, Christ, Jesus himself, is the one who imparts life to all who believe. We can live without guilt in life, with no fear in death, because this is the power of Christ in us. Let's stand to sing.
praise you, gracious Father, that we are alive in Christ. And although things press upon us, we know that they will not crush us. We may be burdened, but we know that we will not be destroyed. For no power of hell or plots of man can snatch us from your preserving hand. And so we ask that you will send us out to minister your presence, to go forth and to promote life, to proclaim freedom from death in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Please do be seated. And do join us again this evening at 6.30 for our Zoom meeting where we'll join together and to lift our minds and voices to our Lord God. And I'm praying that the Lord would use this to um, to stir us up, really stir us up in these uh, wearying um, times. So I look forward um, to seeing you all um, later today.